I don't really believe in in that sitting down or going om. I don't believe in in meditation in the sense of where you're trying to separate yourself isn't a point to try and find unity. So for me, every second is a meditation. Everything you do is a meditation, whether you're washing Absolutely. dishes, you know, driving a car, whatever. There's a an old friend of mine who's passed on now, and and one of his thing that he that he spoke to me was there's only two ways to be in life, only two. And he said, it's whether you're in joy or not in joy. And you know the difference because once you've experienced joy, you know when you're not actually in joy. Exactly. And most of the time when people are miserable, they don't want to understand that they're creating that. You know, no matter how bad things get on the planet, I mean, look at the planet right now, okay? But you can still separate yourself from the madness if you get that it's all an illusion and you don't have to buy into it and that you're still here to have a good time. And a lot of times I'll tell my clients or my listeners, you know, if you're not having a good time, you need to look at why are you creating anything less. Yeah, I, I like that. I, you know, I've always had that sense of co-creation that we make. And I guess this is how you can, I think, really tell just by what a person's doing in the sense of when you say just what you said that tells me a lot that tells me that this is a person that's very similar to myself in that for a long long time they were just being themselves and not really caring what joe you know freaking bob or harry said or wanted them to do they're just being right. who they well, are you want to be yeah so i can honestly tell you that i've never wanted to be anybody but myself I love myself. I get a kick out of myself. I crack myself up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sometimes I'll re-listen to a show if one of my listeners says, wow, you're really wild today. I'll go in and listen and just be laughing as hard as they are. Uh, so, you know, I've never been one of those people, oh, I wish I was this person or I wish I had what this person has or whatever. I've always basically loved myself unconditionally and enjoyed being me. I picked it. I'm good at it. And this is who I am this time around. <laughs> yeah. It's like I'm the best at being me. So why would I want to be anybody else? <laughs> Absolutely. Why would I want to be anybody else? Everybody else is pretty much foobar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have a total agreement. Yeah. This is uh, very cool because I like to peruse David's pages every now and again. It was uh, just one of those things that made me click on your banner and do a little reading and think, I think this might be a very interesting person. And, and I could already sense a, a few similarities in the way that we both kind of live in the sense of being oneself. And for me, that's one of the most important things that you can do at this time is to be who you are. Exactly. Be who you are, love who you are, own up to it, and get on with it. People say to me, you know, who do you channel when you're reading for us and this and that? I say, channel my higher self. Who the hell's smarter than that? Right on. I think the same way that why would I want to go to that person or that person for a channeling session when all I got to do is just tune in? Right. Well, most people don't want to tune in. They're afraid. Someone else to tell them what yeah. to do. Some people are blocked. I don't mind working with people, but, you know, I educate them and give them tools I don't just say, here's your future. You know, I say, here's your best options. This is what you chose. If you still want it, this is what you have to do. Yeah, it's not about just telling them what they want to hear. No, I never tell people what they want to hear. Yeah. They're always going to hear what spirit has for them to hear that particular day. Keeping all this in mind, what is it in your guesstimation that makes a hero of today? What makes a hero today? Or what defines a hero today? I think a hero today is somebody living authentically who's actually doing something for someone else and for the planet. And most of our heroes are unsung heroes. You'll never see them on TV or on regular radio. These are the people I seek out for my show. Yep. I don't tell my guest any of my spiritual thoughts, but I do know that every guest I've ever had on is in a very powerful spiritual teacher or they would certainly not be on my show. Yeah. See, and I don't have a problem with, with talking to spiritual stuff, because for me, one of my favorite things when I travel with the elders is just sitting around the fire and listening to stories. Uh -huh. and, and for me, that's kind of the way I, I do my show, where I hope to be an ear or a, a nice big easy chair, non-judgmental easy chair, that we can swap stories over, mm -hmm. you know, over that fire sitting in our easy chairs. The old native people, that's how they taught, you know, they told stories. And they left it up to you whether or not you wanted to hear the story or not. Well, I find when, even when I'm counseling people, that I'm always telling them stories. 
I will tell them whatever story I'm sharing with you is because you need to hear that story. And I just trust it and go with it. Now I start to understand why I had all the experiences I had in my life. Because had I not, I would not be as useful to my clients or my students as I am because I've experienced it. That actually brings up an interesting question as to who has been your favorite guest and why? Well, I'll tell you, I've had a lot of guests through the years on my show. My favorite guest still, I think, was Dr. Arun Gandhi, Mahatma mm -hmm. Gandhi's grandson. The reason, because he is Mahatma yeah. Gandhi's grandson. Yeah. And it was probably the only time that I lost it on the air. Mm -hmm. uh, my professional edge, you know, I had rewatched the movie two nights before he came on the show. When I asked him, I was trying to be as professional as I could, and then my little, my inner child never went inside, by the way. She just bubbled forth and she just said, oh my God, what was it like to have Gandhi as your grandfather? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and he was so beautiful about it. You know, he's such a beautiful man. Then I had asked him, you know, what do you think of that movie? How accurate's that movie? And he said that there's never a time that he watches that movie that he doesn't cry because it's so true to his grandfather. So for me, you know, even though the God, that had to have been eight or nine years ago, it's still number one for me because I never lost it with anybody on my show. And I certainly had a lot of bigger names than his on my show. But for me, that was the big thrill. And John Robbins, who happens to be another fabulous light warrior on the planet of the Baskin Robbins fame, even right. though he gave that all up and walked away from it. He's probably one of the best environmentalists on the planet. So interviewing him was also a big thrill. On the other side of that, if you want to say, who did you have the hardest time with and why? Well, there was one man that was invited on my show by one of my ex co hosts emphasis on the X. <laughs> I had told him I didn't want the man on my show because he's a racist and he's a hateful bastard. And I said, if he says anything hateful on my show, that's it. I'm going to go crazy. My co-host at the time, because uh, he somehow was familiarly connected to this guy, brings him on the show. And it's kind of like a, it was an environmental show. And this guy starts spewing his hate right before my break. Was slamming the Jews. I mean, I never oh, met anybody so ugly in my entire life. And when we went to break at that time, I was doing live radio. I did not know that I had forgotten to mute my microphone. <laughs> and I let my, my co-host have it. And I said, I told you this bastard was going to do this on my show. I don't allow this kind of hatred. I'm not bringing him back on the air blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I start getting all these instant messages all over my screen. Marie, your mic's on. <laughs> and my listeners loved it so because they were commenting on how I'm consistent yeah. on and off the air because yeah. obviously they were feeling his hatred too, but they got to hear me spew it through <laughs> another unhappy coincidence. So he is one of two people that I have actually stricken in all the years of doing my show, stricken from my archive, eliminated his name on my uh, website, will have absolutely nothing to do with if people even forward me anything from him. I instantly delete it. I won't even pay attention to it. Wow. His initials were JK. That's as far as I want to go because I don't want to draw his nasty ass energy back into my life after all these years. But he's still spewing the same kind of hate and racism. There was, you know, a couple other interviews that were hard for me. You know, like uh, I had one guy on once that had a really bad stutter and he didn't bother telling me that before the show. So that was a, that was a bitch getting through that show. Uh, and another one with a fabulous author, but he just wouldn't speak. Yeah. I had to keep telling him, are you still there? Hello, this is radio. It's not TV. Uh, so those were probably the difficult ones. There are some other people out there that I don't respect at all. They pose as alternative media. They pose as light. They're not. And instead of getting into, you know, I said, they said, this kind of stuff, I just tell people, pay attention to not only who I have on my show, but who's never who's been on my show. You know, that's your big clue. I don't need to go out slamming these people, but they couldn't buy their way onto my show. Yeah, I totally understand. And I have found this with, I won't say a lot of 
authors, but with a number of authors, they can be a tough time on the radio. They'll either give you one word comebacks, like, yep, no. Yeah. And it's like, uh, okay. <laughs> they really people make can you write, work. but that doesn't necessarily mean they can speak. But they also need to know how to say no to being interviewed if they don't want to speak. Yeah. I get so many submissions every week from people, everything from books to videos to you name it. Before I even review it, I will ask, are you open to an interview? Because if they're not, I have plenty of other books that I could be reading. <laughs> exactly. That's the one thing I like about doing the show is my library's gotten a lot bigger. <laughs> well, I can't keep every book that, that, that I get. I mean, I keep the ones that I think are spectacular. And yeah. after a while, you're still going to think about 13 years of submissions. Yeah. And then uh, I just stack them up and uh, recycle them over eBay. Do you do the show every week or is it every day or what? I do the show four shows every week. I usually pop up. Uh, of one of my golden oldies on Fridays. But right now I'm still backing into some of my old archives, so I'll be hopefully this weekend putting up some old shows uh, in a row from 2006. Uh, so, yeah, people get at least four shows a week that are new. Sometimes six, it just depends. Sometimes, I, even though I say I'm not going to overschedule myself, because there's so many, you know, up and ready topics that sometimes I have five and six a week. Yeah. And you're the perfect person to ask this because I've always wanted to know. What are the differences between having a show on a radio station and a webcast internet site? Well, the differences are huge for me, okay? If somebody's new starting out with a, you know, and there's so many new people and a lot of people have credited me with how many other uh, internet radio shows that are out there. Uh, the main difference is I truly believe radio is dead. I predicted that years ago that the internet would surpass radio, TV, and newspapers, oh, which yeah. it's done. Yeah. Uh, the censorship on radio, I don't even like going on anyone else's radio show as a guest because I get very impatient during the never-ending commercials. Oh, and then you got to stop every five seconds right, for a you one. stop every few minutes, you lose your train of thought, you lose the audience. Um, the beauty of doing my show online is I don't have to answer to anybody. I can say and do whatever I want. I interview whoever I want and don't have to if I don't want to. And once it's done, it's there forever because I archive all my shows. And I think that that's why I get solicited from the people that I do. You know, people say, how do you find your guests? Well, my guests find me. <laughs> uh, you know, the first year or two, yeah, I was out there, you know, scrounging around trying to find guests for my show like anybody else. Uh, and I think the reputation of my show, the fact that my guests know they can say whatever they want, they're free to talk because we have a solid hour where I take one two-minute break. Um, really makes a difference, but I also have a spectacular listening audience. They're not just people sitting back getting their ears tickled. They're activists. They're people that are going to do the work. They're going to buy the books. They're going to follow the movies. Uh, and that's another reason why people love coming on my show, because they know I don't have an audience who's just sitting there zombied out. Yeah, and that's why even back when I started the show in 2001, I always kept my shows. I have an archive of even though keeping them changes back that, you know, right. long you were keeping right. everything on cassette tape. Now, I was always recording, but now, like, to put up these shows from 2006, there's still window media files. Right. I mean, I went from, I don't remember how many different formats. Yeah. So <laughs> any old shows now that I put up, I have to convert the files. Yeah. Um, but, you know, luckily we can do that and keep up with it. But, you know, when you have, you know, 10 or 11 years of shows and you want to convert them, that's a whole lot of work. Yeah. Tell me about it. I've, uh, yeah. Right. It's, it's uh, and people like, don't think of the research work, the editing that goes on. It's like when I edit a show, I'm, I edit them pretty good where they're pretty close to being DVD quality. And, I mean, that takes a long time. Well, I don't edit any of my shows. They put them out just the way they came out. I guess we can call it high resolution because my files are huge. I keep them in their original format. Nice. So when I actually have the time to package them and put them together uh, and get them out there, it's going to be super clean. 
And, you know, a lot of people, oh, it's a long download or whatever. I said, yeah, but my show's crystal clean. Yeah, that's so I important. I don't want it to sound like, you know, like we're talking on two salt boxes. Yeah, exactly. 